Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. This is Coach Chris with Critical Bench, and I have with me today Mr. Mike Gillette, the face of strength psychology. And, Mike, this is your personal story. That's what this very unique product is based on. It's based on everything that you endured in your life and and turned you into the man that you are today. And you have a obviously a very uh, interesting skill set to be able to share with the masses to help make them uh, mentally tougher and, and just just tougher in general in, in terms of how they, they go about living their life. And uh, so let me just be the first one to say thank you so much for putting yourself out there like that, and we are absolutely thrilled to have you uh, on the line with us today. Well, I appreciate that, Chris. It's a pleasure to be speaking with you. And as uh, as you listeners probably already know, uh, you know, we have a relationship with Mike. We've done other things with him before, never something quite like this. Uh, it was typically more on his uh, his physical ability uh, and, uh, and you know, the feats of strength and all that stuff, which is, uh, you know, t- tied in a little bit to this, obviously. But uh, this really comes down to somebody who has been through so much in his personal life and then turned that into something that just drove him into all these other amazing things that he did from the uh, being in the Army as a paratrooper to a SWAT commander, uh, martial arts, Masters Hall of Fame, counterterrorism work with the Department of Homeland Security, bodyguard to Fortune 500 at executives, and and obviously uh, in this phase of his life doing uh, you know record-setting strongman uh, feats of strength and and it, it's 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 so impressive obviously you know the the resume but it, there's no one else quite like Mike and that's why we want him to be able to answer questions about why is being tough so important in your life and there's no one better on the planet to speak about stuff like this so I have a. Uh, some pretty in-depth questions. We're going to get right to it here. Uh, Mike, young men obviously go through a lot of tough times from age 15 to 20. They, they're trying to figure out what kind of man they're going to be. And, and during this time, they get their, their first real job. They have their first meaningful relationship or relationships. They graduate high school. They select a college or potentially join the military or they decide to jump right into the working world sometimes. If you could tell a young man two key things about how to face life and deal with the outside pressures of the real world, what would you say? Mm, I, I like that. The, um, there, there, there's a lot of aspects uh, to, to all of that. You know, it's, it's a, a challenging time to be a young man. Uh, and I think there's a lot of uh, challenges uh, that young men, men face with respect to just sort of navigating their way to what being a man means. So if I had two things to say to a, a man in that age range, I think the first one would be uh, simply actually think about the kind of man you want to become. Uh, you know, we have a, a culture that sort of fosters uh, an extended adolescence. Uh, we, we have a lot of uh, men who are, are really more boy-like in their thinking, uh, in, their, uh, in the things that they pursue. And I think young men need to be encouraged to think like men, to uh, think about what it means to be a man. And then number two, don't let anyone talk you out of that. Mm. Because we, we have a culture that doesn't really encourage men to be men. You know, to to make strong decisions, to stand for something. You know, everyone sort of you know goes along to get along. Uh, don't make waves. Uh, you know, we're, we're sort of a controversy averse culture uh, in some ways. Um, we uh, we confuse disagreements with being disagreeable. Uh, we confuse uh, taking a stand uh, with being judgmental. And as a result, we don't have a lot of rugged individuals. And, you know, the world needs more strong men, and strength starts on the inside. No doubt. No doubt about that. Wow, that's uh, that's pretty cool because when you say it, it sounds so simple. 
think about what kind of man you want to become and, and B, don't let anyone stop you from, you know, being, becoming that man. And it's, uh, it's amazing in life how we sometimes do end up kind of listening too much to what others think we should, you know, we should be doing with our lives and, and don't pursue our dreams and pursue our, uh, our manhood, uh, you could say, in the way that we, we want to. So that's, uh, that's, pretty, that's pretty great. And I think that's something like you, you alluded to, that it, it wasn't that way if you go back 50 to, you know, 60, 70 years ago, I think men had, had to grow up faster. And today we've, we've, uh, we've, we've kind of, uh, <laughs> we, we've allowed them to just kind of take their time and, and, it ha- and it's worked against us. Yeah. I, I think there's a lot, there's a lot of young men who are sort of languishing in boyhood and there, there's confusion uh, to a certain degree as yeah. to uh, what you know, desirable male qualities are. And, you know, it, it, it be, being a strong person is not being a bully. Uh, being someone who is firm in their convictions is, is not uh, someone who is, is judgmental or intolerant. But we're, we're not a, a culture that really handles disagreements well. You know, we, we tend to shout at each other until one person just gets tired and shuts up. We, we don't really engage in the vigorous intellectual debate very well. So uh, a, a lot of uh, what uh, was once commonplace is just not that prevalent. And as a result, I think that when you do see uh, a man who is strong and firm in his convictions, uh, they they tend to attract a lot of attention. They there, there's something uh, you know charismatic uh, about that. People are drawn to that. People Absolutely. still uh, look look uh, for leaders to emerge and. You know, a leader is someone who is strong, who knows knows what they think, knows what they believe, and will communicate that, not uh, in a, uh, you know, unpleasant or inappropriate way, but strongly. Yeah. Wow. Terrific. Well said. I like it. That's great insight. Um, moving on to uh, some other very interesting questions. When I write a question, I, I, I really uh, – <laughs> I read a paragraph. I can't just write a simple question. It just doesn't work that way. Uh, so no, for number two here, I wrote, choices define us in life, big ones and little ones. We can look the other way when we see someone else break the law. We can intervene when we see someone getting treated unfairly. We can decide to wake up early and get stuff done or sleep in and play catch up all day long but never actually get there. How closely connected are the big and little choices and their impact on us? And I guess I can, I can kind of stop there or I can just kind of continue because, well, why don't I continue and, I'll, I'll, and we can kind of talk around this topic. Does a minor variable such as sleep really determine the kind of life we are to live? Does looking the other way when someone else has been mistreated make us weak? Are mentally tough people just better at doing what's necessary or what's right, even when they may not like it. Well, there's a lot of good stuff in there uh, to (laughs) potentially unpack. I I like a lot of that, Chris. Um, I'm going to get back to the very first part of the question because I think it's sort of the linchpin upon uh, which everything else rests. Yes. And I have... uh, you know, be, because I'm a, a more mature fellow, which is a, a polite way of saying I'm, I'm getting old, uh, I, I, <laughs> right. that simply means, Chris, that I have said some of the same things more than once. Uh, anyone who's been in a in a teaching role or in a, a training role, you know, has you know uh, a number of the same types of people uh, that they come in contact with, and there are certain things that they find themselves, myself included, uh, repeating uh, to fresh ears. And one of them, and you know, this this goes back to uh, my days when I was a, a field training officer. Uh, in my days in law enforcement, I would uh, train young uh, law enforcement officers that were brand new, fresh out of the academy. 
And there was a phrase I kept hearing myself repeat, and it's appropriate in the context of your question, and that is, life is choices. And it really is. Everything uh, that we are is sort of a sum total of the choices we make. We make uh, big choices and little choices, like you alluded to, and how we deal with those choices has everything to do with, with who we are, the kind of person uh, that we make ourselves into. So it's not just the, the big deal choices where people are, are clear on what the right course of action or, or what the, the wrong course of action might be, but it's, it's the little things too. Uh, I was reading something recently that uh, is on uh, the Internet having to do with just habit and why it's important to make your bed every morning when you get up because it's it creates momentum. It creates the perception of productivity. If the first thing you do is take care of some business every day, then it's a lot easier to continue that momentum forward and continue to take care of other business throughout the day. And a lot of time management and self-help experts sort of allude to that, that type of thinking, but uh, it makes sense. Now, right. I don't really care what your, your bed looks like, um, but I think there's wisdom in that. We are what we do. I mean, that, that goes back to Aristotle. Um, you know, right. Aristotle said that the excellence is a habit. We are what we repeatedly do. And I think that's absolutely the case. Now, you gave a couple of examples of, you know, people that, uh, you know, look the other way or are perhaps more inwardly focused than externally focused. And th those are sorts of uh, aspects about how that type of decision making, you know, can, can manifest. But when it comes to choices, that's that's what defines us. You know, we, um, you know, with the old uh, expression, you know, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. I think most of us want to be a good person, but being a good person requires, you know, active participation in life. It requires work. It requires uh, a conscious attention to that which should be attended to, and that all gets back to your decision-making. So one who makes strong choices is a strong person. That's why I will say strength starts on the inside. You know, not everyone uh, is physically gifted. I know some very uh, strong people mentally who have some type of physical limitation, but they are strong people. Right, right, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, think of the strength... It, it's required to somebody who has physical limitations, yet they just seem to will themselves to be able to do things. I mean, they're they're insanely insanely strong. That the, the that their drive and their willpower and their 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 passion for for life is uh, is stronger than somebody else that's perfectly healthy. In some cases, so one hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. No, it's very cool, and it, it's that. That's kind of when I was coming up with that question. I, uh, I was uh, fairly certain I like knew how you would answer it, <laughs> but obviously, again, with your background, it uh, there's always like a, a cool story, you know, and uh, you know of, of why that question resonates with you. So, uh, very cool. Moving on, I'm sure when anyone from 20 to 40 years old, think back to our soldiers, uh, American soldiers that fought in World War II, we think of some pretty tough guys, right? You know, we see there's famous statues and stuff like that of, of, of soldiers uh, raising the, the American flag. There's all kinds of, of cool things that, that resonate, I think, with, with men and, and, and a tough soldier. Guys that had no choice but to fight a real-world threat, on the other side of the world. But yet today, we're still dealing with threats from the other side of the world. But since the life we live today is so different from our grandfathers and great-grandfathers' generation, you know, this, the life, the world we're in now, the computer age, is it safe to say that today's world is filled with mentally weak wimps? And I, I know that sounds a bit harsh, but it, it just feels as though the young men in the world in the world today just don't have the mental toughness that existed a few generations back. Could you give some insight maybe on, on, on that question? 
Um, okay. The uh, I mean, it's it, it is a harsh sounding diagnosis, but that doesn't mean that it is necessarily incorrect. And I think that um, uh, if you know, we had uh, people from you know, the forties. You know, these basically you know, anyone from like seventeen year olds, you know, to guys in their mid twenties that were um, you know being drafted or volunteered, you know, in mass. And, and fighting for extended periods with you know, limited equipment, uh, the wrong kind of clothing, and you know, all of the things that they endured, whether it was you know winter time or the jungle, it was bad regardless. Um, if they were to cast their eye, uh, you know, towards the young men of the future, the young men of today, in this case, um, I think they'd be a bit shocked. Yeah, and um, you know. It's it's not to say you know that we're we're sort of you know ma- making uh, one one better uh, or worse, but things are different. And you know, regardless of your perspective uh, on our you know technology based you know highly evolved uh, and, and very sensitive society, uh, it's certainly different than how it was. And uh, better or worse is something I will leave to uh, social critics. Or, or theologians, but it's different. And it's different simply because I think that um, young men are more disconnected from certain parts of themselves than we used to be. You know, And, and part of it is just sort of the way that society works. Uh, people were a lot more connected um, you know, a few decades back. You know, neighborhoods were neighborhoods. You know, people yeah. knew each other. There was a lot more social connectivity face-to-face, and I think there was more of a sense of collective responsibility in a given neighborhood for how things were going on. If there was a problem in the neighborhood, it wasn't just the person who was suffering uh, from vandalism or whatever the issue was. The entire neighborhood would feel compelled to take some kind of action because everyone felt connected in that way. Uh, Conversely, if... uh, I mean, and this is something I remember from my own childhood. If uh, a a young kid in the neighborhood was was acting up, was doing something inappropriate, it was not inconceivable for a unrelated adult to not only yell at them, but possibly, you know, give them a smack on the butt. And no parents were getting offended. No one was threatening to sue anyone else for touching my kid. It was just sort of an expectation because the parent you know, would expect similar participation if their kid was the one that was that was acting inappropriately. Absolutely. So I think that um, there's that aspect. I mean, we just, we socialize differently now. Um, and you can look at a lot of factors. You know, people don't work for the same company for the same extended periods that they, they used to. There's a lot more... Uh, a vocational transition time that takes place. People move around a lot more. Uh, there's the whole issue of, you know, fa- families have been, you know, redefined and redefined, much more fragmented. So a lot of the things, the um, uh, the factors that were present that made people a certain way are not present uh, to the same extent that they used to be. And, you know, good or bad, that's the reality of it, and yeah. it changes how uh, it changes what uh, form society sort of takes uh, in a collective sense. Then there's the you know the technology piece. I mean, we're we're ultimately very disconnected, Chris, from our physical selves in a way that uh, is really unprecedented. I mean, what what's ironic is uh, I have read articles. Uh, from the beginning of the last century, 1910s, 1920s, uh, from people who were bemoaning the physical condition of young people in school and how if we didn't get a handle on that, we would not be strong enough to fight our our enemies from abroad, whoever those enemies might be. Right. Uh, Kennedy picked up that theme some, you know, 40, 50 years later, bemoaning you know, a further physical decline and, you know, promoting the President's Council on Physical Fitness and so forth. So back when everyone seemed to be in really good shape, people were complaining about how not in shape kids were. Right. Which is unbelievable. 
compared to now, what you actually see is a, a redefining of the physical shape of young people. You know, the, the prevalence of crap uh, that is both tasty and convenient to prepare has changed how people look. And that's not a body shaming comment, whatever that phrase means. Um, if, you, if you've got a, a physical issue because you know, of what you put into your body, that's reality. It's not anyone being judgmental. It's something that should be fixed. It's in the best interest of the person afflicted. And so we're sort of afflicted by uh, the, the, the convenience of uh, certain types of foods, the convenience of not having to do a whole lot. I mean, everything we used to do was a lot more physical. I mean, we engaged with the outdoors. We thought it was fun. Uh, nobody wants to go outside anymore. You know, it's, it's hot, it's cold, there's bugs out there. Uh, there's nothing to compete with uh, my video games outside. There's no place to plug them in. Uh, it's just different. So I think that you know, be between the sort of uh, move, uh, it, maybe that's the wrong word, uh, but we, we've definitely devolved to a more sedentary culture. Yeah. Uh, we're putting a lot more crap in our body. You know, tasty though it may be, um, it's not helping us. And, you know, then when you take away some of these sort of, uh, you know, institutional uh, or, you know, uh, so social framework pieces uh, that used to sort of create this the sense of, uh, uh, I don't know, community cohesion where yeah. everybody's kind of off on their own. It just, it has fundamentally changed the landscape. And if if I don't feel connected to you, then I don't feel compelled to intervene on your behalf. So when we we see people not stepping up and doing things that, you know, require a little bit of backbone. Uh, it's not just because, you know, they, they may be weak or frightened. They just think we're, we're fragmented. We're emotionally fragmented from each other in a way that, that's sort of unique. Uh, and, and I think it's a very recent uh, sort of uh, phase of, you know, how our society functions. That was, kind of a high level response. I don't know if that's what you were you're looking no, for, that's, but that's kind of <laughs> those are the types of factors that because yeah. you know, I'm I, I try to be pretty uh you know clinical about this. It's not just uh oh these kids today. You know yeah, right. I, I don't want to sound like another crotchety old person just saying, you know, kids are weak and they don't know the value of the dollar or the value of hard work and, and on and on. Because I I do think that things have changed and I think there's a a, a variety of layers uh, to why that is the case. And it's not a question of, you know, good versus bad. Uh, you know, we all have our opinions on what good versus bad is, but there's no question that we have a much different world and uh, the people populating it here on our own country are different than, uh, you know, our uh, immediate ancestors. Yeah. Yeah, there's there's no doubt about that. Yeah, I, I've learned one thing with you, Mike, that I never and try to anticipate the direction uh, the answer is going to go because I just, you know, I'm talking with somebody <laughs> with with, a, with a, a fairly high IQ who's who's also really educated. So I know it's it's going to be uh, a much grander response than what I uh, <laughs> what I initially thought. Uh, so uh no that was fantastic and and I do think it all really a lot of it comes down to the 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 men in the family you know it it starts with the the patriarch and and I think if you have that 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 strength from from dad in the family that can really create the that that cohesive family unit and if you have enough of those types of dads uh, you know in a particular neighborhood that can become probably a pretty cool neighborhood and uh, it, and I think that's where it starts. And if we had more of that going on, then we would probably be able to turn some things around. You know. Yeah, and there there's there's some directions that that uh, that observation can go to. But I I think yeah, uh, you're absolutely correct with yeah. what you just said. Yeah, that's that's obviously the that that's the uneducated non uh, non clinical response. <laughs> um, yeah, so, but that doesn't make it any less. True. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, now, all guys know the guy 
who was more talented than anyone else in their school growing up. And, and I'm talking elementary, junior high, or high school. He could do anything he wanted physically, and it seemed almost effortless compared to, you know, his, his buddies. His talent for most things physical was just superior to everyone else's. But at a certain point, hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. And you've probably heard that saying before. It's a, kind of a common uh, common uh, phrase in, in, in some uh, gym uh, atmospheres. Uh, so if that's true, is mental toughness the most important aspect for any athlete attempting to become truly great at what they do, does being mentally strong really determine the limits of our physical ability? Uh, great question. And uh, the, the short, inelegant answer is yes. Uh, the longer <laughs> answer is, is a longer uh, explanation of why that's the case. Um, I've seen this in, in a, recently in, in two uh, sort of diverging uh, areas. In the first one, you use the example of that guy we know growing up, or, or maybe there's a couple of those guys we know, the guys that are just literally, you know, came out of the chute, superstars. They're yep. fast. They're coordinated. It's like, what can't they do? And uh, I was almost fascinated by those people when I was a kid, because when I was a kid, you know, small week, uh, not connected to the, the realm of athletics in, in any context. And they, they just seemed so sort of beyond. And I could never really figure out, well, why them? Why not me? You know, what is it? You know, was it the Wheaties for breakfast? I mean, I watched the commercials when I was a kid. <laughs> and uh, what I noticed is um, – over time, and again, you know, I'm, I'm speaking from, uh, from the perspective of someone who's now 53, I run into some of these guys from my, from my childhood or, you know, from, uh, you know, high school years right. periodically, and I see some of these guys that were super You know, some of these guys that went on to be uh, D1 athletes, and I look at them now, and you would have no idea that they were ever physically gifted. Mm -hmm. because all you see is lots and lots of neglect. They are walking around being unremarkable to, to the point of, you know, being overweight, you know, or they're hobbling around. You know, they've, they've just got the infirmities that we associate with disuse. You know, yeah. I, I haven't exercised in so long that I'm walking like an old man now. You know, That's and right. these are guys that, you know, they're you know, 50, 51, 52, 53, like I am, uh, they're way too young to be looking and acting the way they are. Um, I don't know, but I'm, my informal diagnosis is that if everything always sort of came easy to you in the physical realm, then I don't know how much value you placed on that. Uh, I don't know that you ever understood what the gift was and that at some point the gift needs a little care and feeding. Mm -hmm. So for people who are just complete naturals, and we all know these people, you know, male, female, we've, we've been around them. That's right. uh, if the person has never had to really push to have that, it's kind of like, um, oh, let's, let, I'm going to use a strange analogy. Every uh, so often, a boy band comes along. It's been happening for generations. They're super popular, and then they're not. And it has nothing to do with anything other than the cyclical nature of the entertainment industry, you know, and the demographics, the ages of their core audience, and how quickly that audience shifts from one thing to another thing. So there, there's an intense period of success, and then there's just crickets. And if you were a member of one of those boy bands, how perplexing would that be? Because you did the same thing for a period of time, and then suddenly you were hot. You continued to do the same thing, and suddenly you weren't hot anymore. You kept continuing to do the same thing, and no one cares. You don't really understand what it was that made you successful. I think that people who are physically gifted 
can be in that same sort of conundrum. You know, I was always this, I was always that, I was looked great, and now I look like poop. What happened? Right. And, Whereas, and, no, one ca- and, and no one cares about me anymore. <laughs> I'm not, yeah, I'm not yeah, a big that, deal yeah, anymore. I, yeah, that that's true too. That that's that's, uh, that's another layer, a sad layer that we might lay on top of it. But compare that to somebody who was good enough physically, but mentally would just outwork everyone else. Mm-hmm. You know, would just go and go and go. And those are the people I think where it sticks. Where you know you look at them today. They still look as good as any 50-year-old, as any 60-year-old has a right to look because they beat it into themselves. You know, they forged themselves into that athlete, you know, that that person who could do X, Y, Z. And the person who can forge themselves into that is the mentally tough athlete. And... uh, Now, here's the other uh, sort of disparate example. Uh, I'm presently working with a gymnastics club. It's a high-level club, one of the top ten clubs in the nation. Uh, They've got lots and lots of, and these are girls, uh, which for people who look at the scary pictures of me on the Internet, it it might be a little hard to fathom. Uh, But they're very tough, and and they're not afraid of me anymore. That's right. The uh, you know, these are kids, you know, like fourteen, fifteen. They already have their D one scholarships in the bag. They're really gifted, but the ones that truly excel are the ones who are mentally tough. And you can look at some of these athletes, and, and it's an interesting thing. Um, we look at uh, a person's book or their their DVD. And, you know, maybe this person's super strong or they're super muscular and it's like, this, this is what I did to get this way. And we say, okay, great, I'm going I'm to try that out. What's interesting, if you look at the world of competitive athletics, what you typically see are a group of people who do all the same thing. And in the world of gymnastics, you have a group of athletes, they all do the same thing every day, day in, day out, and yet you still have a diversity of body types. Because there's no getting around that. Now, you have plenty that uh, appear to be the, the cliché gymnast physique, you know, short, dense, solid muscles, you know, kind of wide. They look like they can pick up a balance beam and beat you with it. Um, right. And then there are some that sort of defy that. There are some that are kind of skinny. There are some that don't really look that strong but they can still, you know, go and do everything else. Those are the kids who just want it so bad that they are wringing every ounce of potential from their less than ideal physiques. That comes from mental toughness. You know, that's th- those are the kids that are going to just uh, get themselves there any way they can. You know, the desire is tremendous. Now, of course, there is that perfect storm athlete in every sport has these where, you know, physical giftedness is combined with a terrifying work ethic. And when you have that, then you have, yeah, yeah, then you don't want to compete against those people <laughs> because they, <laughs> and, they, they will just be uh, unstoppable. Yeah, I, I actually but thought it's a really of that. Cool thing it, is, it is. It is. It's, it's actually um, that's that person that just at all levels, and I, I you know, I, I'm a big follower of all kinds of sports, and, uh, you know, I, I love college basketball. I love, I mean, that's, that's the person that just excelled at their high school, dominated in college. And then let's just say they went on to the NBA and they just are, are, you know, just crushing it right from the get go. That's just that, that perfect storm that, yeah, you know, comes, uh, you know, it's, it's your Michael Jordan's, your Tiger Woods type, type of guy, you know, it's just, yeah. they, they're just here and there and it's easy to, to pick, uh, pick those two out but you know there's obviously lots of others uh that that are you know in in the current world of sports um well and moving on just because uh you know i don't want the people to to, to not uh hear about you talk about fear uh because fear is a huge part of mental toughness and so my question is the the topic of fear is so compelling because we all have them. We all have fears on some level. 
some of us fear seemingly harmless things like performing karaoke, uh, public speaking, or interviews like this. Some of us have real powerful forms of fear, like a fear of heights, fear of confrontation, or snakes. Fear can be physically dangerous to us or simply emotional. Uh, but both of us, but both can be very real to the person feeling them. What three things, and I, you know, see, see if you can come up with three things quickly. Uh, can someone tackling a fear-based situation do right away to help them deal with that fear and potentially work through it and overcome it? Um, great question. Uh, a, a challenge to sort of distill down to, to something uh, that quick, uh, yeah. just because there, there's sort of a, a myriad of issues that can feed into that. I think sure. that uh, when we're talking about fear, Chris, the, yeah. the, fir the first thing that's important is to uh, be very uh, honest with oneself. And it's uh, fear is, is a challenging topic, particularly for males. Um, we you know, guys are not always um, honest with themselves. Uh, they particularly when it relates to p things that they perceive as shortcomings. And I don't think that there's any guy who has a fear of something that they're proud of. Hey, did I ever mention what I'm afraid of? It's a long list. And guys, <laughs> guys are not going to uh, initiate that conversation. Yeah, you know, that's, that's, that's not, that's guys not hanging out. Buried. That's not hanging yeah. out at the bar having a beer with your buddy talking, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, talking exactly. about that. Yeah. So the, um, the, the first thing is to open yourself up to what is true. And it is true. Everyone has things that they're afraid of. Um, even the most uh, hardened, courageous uh, men among us have something that they don't want to lose. So when that's the case, you know, I'm not afraid of anything. Well, um, do you have a home? Do you have, do you have a spouse? Do you have kids? Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. It's Sometimes it's so external to you, you don't think about it, but there's there's something there, and there's generally a few things uh, for most people. So understand that it exists. Then identify it. What what specifically exists? What is it that, that we're afraid of? And some of them are kind of rational. You know, we have uh, members of the armed forces who are deployed overseas in harm's way. Do you think they're afraid? Of course. Is that fear reasonable? Of course it is. If it were absent, might that indicate a potential problem? Yeah. Somebody who's not afraid in combat is prone to getting themselves or someone else hurt because they're not really acting in accordance with the uh, the risks involved. So we need to, uh, to sort of open ourselves up to the existence of fear. Then we need to identify what what our own fears are. Or if if there's a couple of them, what's the one that really seems to be getting in the way? Yeah. Then when we know what, what fear is getting in the way, and as you pointed out, Chris, it can be things that are fairly innocuous. You know, the, the fear of public speaking, every, everyone uses I use that frequently as an example. It's a good one. Um, yes. And uh, I think that uh, the best thing is from that point on is to figure out, well, what's, what's the plan here? How are we going to deal with this? Um, and some people have the goal of making fears go away. I think that's that's unrealistic. I think that uh, your mind also realizes it's unrealistic, and there, there's a thing about dealing with anything mind-related, and that is you cannot lie to you. Your mind knows when you are BSing it. So when people say things like, and these are well-meaning people, but when people say things like, well, you know, you just have to think positive. Uh, you just have to, you know, do this thing or that thing. Um, if it doesn't feel like that's the right thing for you or if that's realistic for you, your mind subconsciously is going to reject that notion. 
Mm-hmm. So you can't lie to you. You can't act as though everything is okay uh, if it's if it's not okay. You you need to at least address it. And I think that one of the things that more people are afraid of than they realize are negative. Well, let's not even call them negative. Let's call them difficult emotions. That that's a phrase uh, I learned from a uh, hypnosis trainer named Craig Siegel, and I like it a lot. Uh, difficult emotions, um, you know, because all all emotions have uh, you know something potentially to to offer in in terms of instruction. Yeah. So people don't like to feel fat. As an example, people will do any number of things to avoid feeling sad. You know, they they drink, uh, they distract themselves with uh, choices that may not be, you know, healthy for them in the, in the long run, or they just do immersive uh, activities to keep their minds engaged, you know, uh, video games or, you know, whatever it happens to be. To si- kind of sidetrack themselves from that, yeah, from absolutely. whatever that is. Yeah. It's, it's just kind of a, a little temporary anesthesia from, you know, what, whatever is, is going on because they don't want to feel sad. Um, I propose uh, something kind of radical. If, if you're experiencing a difficult emotion, maybe you could just experience it. Wow. Just, <laughs> hey, there it is. Just, just, um, just, if, just, if your girlfriend uh, yeah. has left you mm-hmm. and you feel bad, maybe you should. Yeah. Because that reflects that this was important. We, If if the first inclination is, well, I guess I have to go and get drunk for three days uh, and just kind of numb myself out, well, I don't think there's a lot of learning there. I don't think that uh, whatever it was that may have led to her leaving, you know, I mean, it may have been because she's a crappy person. It may be because you're a crappy person. It may be that you were not well suited for each other. But you're not going to come to any sort of sense of clarity if all you do is hide from the unpleasantness. Yeah. We as a culture, Chris, do not in these uh, modern times, do not do difficult things well. We tend to avoid them, and then we tend to rationalize uh, our inability to confront difficult things, uh, whether it's emotional or we were talking physical uh, earlier, uh, with with all sorts of you know very uh, you know compelling, well reasoned uh, sound, sounding ways. But the bottom line is we don't do difficult well, and that's not the hallmark of a tough person. You know, a tough person can handle. The, the negativity that comes from, you know, some, some of the situations that life will throw at us, you know, mm-hmm. the, the loss that one uh, has to deal with when, when a loved one dies. You know, sometimes you just have to experience difficult emotions. If yeah. people don't uh, handle things like that, okay, because... You know, death, separation, those, those are inevitable things. That, that's just a byproduct of life on this planet. And if you cannot deal with that, then eventually you're going to find yourself shrinking away from other things that cause disappointment. And many things that can cause disappointment are things that are amazing if they work. You know, one of the reasons that uh, I've done some things which uh, are unique is because I'm not talented, I'm not necessarily smart, I just, I can, I can take it. I can handle what, whatever the, the cost is, whatever the pain is. Yeah. I can endure things. And I believe it is the capacity to endure that sometimes is the greatest talent of all. Because it allows me to hang on long enough until I get that thing. Right. Yeah, so, and, and if and if, and if anyone listening hasn't read your personal story uh, on the uh, on the psychology of strength uh, page, then you know they should because that would give them a little bit of a uh, a blueprint for your ability to endure because of what you endured for so many years of your childhood and even in your early adulthood. And when you go through so many difficult situations and then 
and it, I think it just prepares you for the next difficult situation. You just handle things better. You know? Yeah, if, if, everything if, is uh, is context. You know, I yeah. had a uh, I had a boss uh, about ten years ago who used to be a, a squadron commander for Delta Force. Okay, so and anyone doesn't know what that is, that is the Army's uh, top secret uh, anti-terrorism force. And uh, sometimes they call it the unit when they make a TV show about it. Now, because they made a TV show about it, how top secret is it really? Not very. <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, when I worked for this guy after he had uh, retired from uh, active duty service, uh, I found that he was not particularly tolerant of excuses or much of anything that didn't have to do with getting the job done. And he, people would approach him and they would say, well, you know, I'm dealing with this or I'm dealing with that. And he'd say, look, and th this was in Las Vegas. So generally he would look outside and the sun would be shining because that's what it does in Las Vegas. He'd say, look, the sun is shining and no one is shooting at you. I don't want to hear about it. <laughs> so depending on your life experience, some things can seem like a big problem. For him, many things didn't seem like a problem at all because of his own life experience. I, so uh, when you confront the things that are difficult, you are mentally stronger. When we're talking about fear to sort of uh, tie that up, what's important is to acknowledge its existence, identify what specifically you're dealing with, because in, until you do that, you're not really going to be able to formulate a plan for handling it. You know, maybe it's something that has to do with your own personal safety, but so many times it's just something that has to do with your comfort level, you know, your ego, uh, you know, saving face, just doing things that are unpleasant or difficult. And if they're merely unpleasant, well, that's, that's doable. You know, we can yeah. handle that. We, we just have to choose to. Yeah. And... If it involves dealing with something that's that's unpleasant, then you know deal with it. You know take it. You you can handle it. We're we're yeah. just out of practice. That's right. But that's we exactly right. It. We just have to practice by putting ourselves in those situations and then realizing once once we come out the other side. Oh wow! How many times do you hear somebody who who did something they had strong anxiety about, serious nervousness about, and they go. That really wasn't that bad afterwards. Yeah. And, yeah. and you go, yeah, yeah. I know. I can't believe it, I waited this long to do it. <clears throat> That's another They one. built it up into their head, into this monster that was like something they could not accomplish. And then, oh, that really wasn't that bad. Why did I waste a whole year, like, stressing myself out about that? And then, boom. Right. So, I yeah. mean, and a lot of things in life are, are that way. And, uh, no, that, that's great. I, <clears throat> I really appreciate your insight on that because I know, as I stated, we all face fears on some level. And to be able to listen to somebody who's dealt with his, his own set of fears and, and how he's come out on the other side and, and, and dealt with them and overcome them and, uh, and, and moved on, uh, that, that's fantastic. Well, you know, thank you. I could, obviously, we could talk for hours. We already have. Uh, and uh, I, I'd love to continue the conversation. And uh, But I just really appreciate your time and your uh your ability to really dissect some of these questions. And uh, I know I've gotten a lot out of it and enjoyed it. I hope the listeners all have. And, uh, folks, this is Mr. Mike Gillette of Strength Psychology. He's one in a billion. There's really no one else like him. And uh, we really hope that uh, you're able to check that out and uh, really hopefully change your lives because of all the wonderful things and tools that Mike is able to give you. Thank you so much, Mike, for your time. Thanks so much, Chris.